Derived from federal investment during the Cold War, the Internet has seen itself in a perpetual tug of war between public and private interests since its inception. In the ensuing decades, innovation has been hampered to the interests of large players, who argue that they should control access, but also only provide it when it suits their business interests, while regulators have been happy to work on the industry's behalf against the people that they're supposed to actually serve. While there's a saying that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, sometimes those who learn history are also gifted with the solution to their current problem. In order to understand how the entire industry got taken over by a few giants, it helps to have some historical context. If we're ever going to get out of this problem, we need to know how we got into it. The wide open spaces in the United States aren't just a part of the national character, but they've also helped to spur innovation as well. ARPANET had multiple reasons for existing. It allowed universities to share research, or, you know, should the Cold War actually come to pass and civilization get destroyed, theoretically it would provide a way for people to communicate. NSFNet replaced ARPANET. 1995 saw NSFNet replaced with the deployments of telecommunications backbones from various private internet service providers. Telecom companies saw this as an opportunity to enter a new market, and believing that more entrants would lead to more competition and more choices for consumers, President Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 96. This act reworked the way telecommunications more or less worked in the U.S. in a number of ways such as deregulating telecommunications and broadcasting services, as well as the way that internet services were provided by those companies. The concept of universal access was also made explicit with regards to telephone service, which held that all Americans should have access to communication services like telephone services at the time. In a short-sighted move, this was not extended to internet services. At this time, there was a large number of telecoms, and following the breakup of the Bell telephone system, it seemed like this would be the case for a while. If you fast forward through three decades of merge and consolidation, though, you see a few companies who no longer compete. They provide services, but there's no real incentive for them to upgrade the services they do provide. Instead of investing in ways to deliver service better than their competitors, the focus is on increasing dividends or buying back stock in order to concentrate the existing profit for shareholders, which boosts earning per share and drives up equity while leaving large populations literally in the dark when it comes to fiber. When they're first starting out in the 60s, cable companies had to use the infrastructure put in place by phone companies. Seeing an opportunity to gouge the would-be tenants, companies began charging two or three times what other phone companies would have had to pay. The FCC attempted to intervene, but decided that it actually lacked the jurisdiction until finally, in 1978, Congress told them they had to, and that telecoms had to allow access to these companies for fair rates that the FCC themselves had to dictate. While government intervention is often knocked, in this case it allowed for the creation of a new market, and provided the rights to access polls that still exist today. At the time, about 4.5 million people subscribed, and cable companies were using AT&T's poll infrastructure to deliver service. At the time, AT&T had no plans to enter that arena. But they might years down the line, so they saw this as enough reason to block cable, which could be a disruptive technology or a competitor. They weren't sure at the time. They weren't taking any chances. Without regulations in place, it's pretty much inevitable that an incumbent technology would use its gatekeeper position to preserve its advantage and smother its competition in its crib. In 1987, phone companies pulled a similar move when they attempted to have data transmission over telephone lines have interstate access charges. If they had their way and got to impose these internet access charges, phone companies would have made internet use that much more costly, and thus that much more of a luxury than the widespread communications medium it is today. Despite the propaganda of people like Dennis Prager about the internet being a product of capitalism and capitalism alone, that is simply bullshit. The internet was created by public funding at American universities. If anything, the internet exists despite the monopolistic tendencies of big businesses. Regulators realize private entities must make an investment to bring those services to an area, but fairly often the first company that enters the market ends up being the only one there. Sometimes it might also not make sense for there to be more than one provider digging up the street or otherwise disrupting life for citizens to bring services in. The idea that one telecommunications provider isn't able to block a competitor's access to market is called common carriage. Theoretically, this is done in exchange for promises to serve the entire area for a reasonable rate, even if they might view this as unfair, like David L. Cohen, Senior Executive VP of Comcast, whose view is clear, and that's that any requirement that our networks, built with private dollars with no guaranteed taxpayer return, would have open to anyone who wanted to retail or wholesale those services at a governmentally regulated rate, that is not a good way to stimulate ongoing investment in the private network. Thing is, private ownership hasn't stimulated investment to the rate most Americans require or that the telecoms have promised. In addition to this, the major players seem to do everything in their power to not invest in upgrades. Whether it's stock buybacks or legislative maneuvering, the large players have demonstrated they're more interested in preserving their cartels than actually serving their customer base. 
So seeing as how terrible Comcast has gotten, why shouldn't you start your own private network? Well, some communities have done exactly that and have found success with a variety of options. In 2001, Lake County, Florida invested in a fiber optic network, electing to treat it as another part of their public infrastructure. This means that the public network sells access to residents and businesses alike instead of everyone there just paying a private network for the connectivity. As a result of this, networks are built out to places other than just the well-populated areas. This means that functionality and quality of life improvements can be distributed throughout the community. A 2005 study done by George S. Ford and Tom M. Kautsky found that when compared against eight other similar counties, Lake County had roughly double the growth that disconnected counties did. Even though they're more likely to be served, urban constituents can still not be served as well, and they've come up with some creative solutions to get around that. NYC Mesh, on the other hand, has taken a community-run approach, connecting a gigabit-fed fiber antenna with a connection of rooftop wireless mesh nodes across over 300 buildings. They're funded by customers for 20 to 50 bucks a month, or 100 bucks for a commercial connection. And since coronavirus, they've been seeing their normal subscription rate double, as more people are finding themselves homebound with an increased need for broadband. Arguably the most famous and most successful instance of municipal broadband is Chattanooga, Tennessee. Nicknamed Gig City due to its high-speed network, Chattanooga's broadband expansion happened when the Electric Power Board, Chattanooga's municipally-run power company, leveraged existing power grid technology with a fiber optic network. By capturing the data present in their electrical grid from having it run in conjunction with our fiber network, EPP is able to deliver both a high-speed connection and a more efficient power system than before. Bento Lobo, professor of finance at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, did research on the impact of EPP's fiber network. He found that in just his first three years of operation, it was estimated that $130 million was saved just from being able to better handle power outages. Lobo found that business energy efficiency was boosted by an additional $234.5 million, and $4.61 million in new business investment was also created. EPB has been wildly popular with their community as well as experts at large, with PC Magazine ranking it as the best ISP in America, emphasizing not just their speed, but also their reliability. Customers also feel like their money is staying in the community, being reinvested back in that community. Comcast has tried fighting EPB's progress, as well as any moves to improve efficiency since day one. Prior to the formation of the fiber network, a smear campaign was launched by rivals like Comcast. In the lead-up to the vote, almost 2,600 TV ads were launched by those rivals, trying to convince Chattanoogans to vote down the proposal. A survey was even launched to try and further drive the point, huh? In the end, though, the people of Tennessee didn't care for Comcast dictating them how they should run their community, though, and the opposite effect happened. People called City Hall with vocal support, and the attempted smear of a survey had 80% people saying they supported EPB's plans. In the perfect demonstration that competition is actually great for broadband services, Comcast now offers their fastest speeds anywhere near Chattanooga. Seeing the success of municipal broadband efforts, Comcast has done everything in their power to block their expansion. In order to fight municipal broadband, telecoms like Comcast have worked with the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. ALEC is a corporate bill mill that writes legislation that politicians are then able to copy and paste in order to pass off as their own. While ALEC's website touts the work done by private markets, it downplays the detriment of some of their greatest hits, like stand your ground laws or poorly thought out privatizations. On its page for its Declaration of Principles on Municipal and Government Owned Networks, ALEC states, As a general matter, such services should not be offered by government in competition with private sector providers. In the event that a municipality elects to deploy a government-owned broadband network, safeguards are necessary to ensure that private sector providers with whom the municipality competes and taxpayers from whom the municipality derives the funding are not harmed or disadvantaged by the municipality in the exercise of its bonding or taxing authority, management of right-of-way, or assessment of fees and taxes. Well, according to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which is a group that advocates for municipal fiber networks, commuter networks are generally faster, more reliable, and cheaper than private carriers and they also provide better customer service. Justifying investment for rural internet has become a losing proposition for these companies. They typically expect a return on investments in the short term, about three or five years. Wall Street also prefers companies that have large sources of free cash so they can pay out fat dividends, so capital expenditures on things like territory expansions or fiber deployments are out of the question. If a company can run service to a clump of customers, like in some metropolitan areas, and they think there's a high enough return on that, they'll make that investment. 
In rural territories, that return doesn't come at the same rate or intensity as it would in an urban environment, so that service isn't provided. Basically, Comcast and Verizon are using their lobbying apparatus to funnel over $13 million and $10 million to preserve their cartels. In exchange for their lobbying efforts, these companies have received exorbitant amounts of money to roll out services in areas, while in many cases they've just pocketed that money and redefined the standards to align with what they already have in place there. As a part of the Comcast NBCU merger, Comcast was required to offer 6 megabytes per second for 50 bucks a month, which it was already selling. A condition of the merger was Comcast's suggestion of a low-income broadband plan that would provide 2.5 million low-income households with broadband service for $10 a month. What they did after that was means test recipients, and although it looked like a public benefit, it was difficult to obtain, and it was impossible if you had had Comcast service at any point before that. Comcast was offering a new customer base a lower rate at a trial basis, but at the end of that, once they got used to that level of convenience, they were raising the price on them. By following this plan, Comcast was able to offer a new customer base a lower rate on a trial basis, so that once they got used to that level of convenience, at the end of that time, they would have to pay the full rate. This is a move that's pretty much the same thing they're doing right now with their COVID-19 response. While the current system gives incumbent companies a ton of power, the state takes it further by sometimes blocking competition with them. In Arkansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Texas, Washington, and my home state of Pennsylvania, the direct sale of municipal broadband is illegal. Like many of the other states mentioned, Pennsylvania is a state with a few major population centers and a large amount of rural space in between. Of 67 counties, 48 are designated rural. Since in some of these cases, there's a lot of distance between dwellings, universal access of phone and internet service has been a concern for a while. For this reason, Act 23 was passed in 2004 by Governor Ed Rendell, which established a $10 million grant funding throughout December 31st, 2015 in order to provide broadband internet access to schools across the state. It also mandated that providers in the area would work to ensure that no Pennsylvanians are without service, regardless of how far from a city they are. However, municipal broadband service is also uncommon in the state of Pennsylvania due to language in House Bill 30. This code enforced rights of first refusal by stating that municipalities seeking to create broadband networks would actually have to get permission from internet service providers in the area. In some instances, this means that a telecom is the only option in an area, and there's no incentive for them to provide better services or cheaper services. While this was originally meant to provide financial consideration to the burden of providers who put new networks in place, it has instead allowed them to block new entries into their territories or to limit the expansions of other competitors. This whole situation is like when I want to pet my dog, but he doesn't want me to pet him right then. So I go to pet the cat, but he sure as hell doesn't want me to pet the cat instead. Additionally, ISPs have a history of not providing the service they've been contracted to provide. Whether it's letting legacy systems they've absorbed fall into disrepair as they absorb competitors, as has been reported by a union of telecommunications workers, or exacerbating an existing crisis like when Verizon throttled firefighters during the 2018 California wildfires. Since deployments in response to wildfires involve the efforts of a massive number of personnel who are organizing myriad efforts, an unlimited connection is often necessary for these departments. For Santa Clara Fire, Verizon SIM card provided their department vehicle OES 5262 with the connection it needed to coordinate local government resources to save the lives and livelihoods of their neighborhoods and loved ones in a race against the clock. In the midst of responding to a fire, the department discovered that their connection was throttled to one two hundredth of the speed they needed. Verizon representatives confirmed the throttling, but rather than restoring us to an essential data transfer speed, they indicated that County Fire would have to switch to a new data plan at more than twice the cost, and they would only remove throttling after we contacted the department that handles billing. In the end, the department had to pool resources with other departments and use their own devices. This same attempt at upselling happened numerous times to Santa Clara as well as other emergency response departments. Because because telecoms see emergencies as negotiation tools. On the other hand, community ISPs are beloved by their neighbors, and there's a real sense the dollars they generate remain in that community and are invested back there, not siphoned off to parts unknown. In a similar situation, there's not as much incentive to try and negotiate data plans while the town burns because that company would find its own assets in danger. For massive companies without a stake in the communities they serve, this is just another business opportunity, not a way to provide a valuable utility to a community. Thanks to a combination of rights of first refusal and broken funding mechanisms, the FCC can sometimes even inadvertently donate your tax dollars to one of these telecoms, more or less for them to not actually provide service while simultaneously blocking you from receiving any. This is exactly what Frontier was able to do with the FCC's 2015 Connect America auction, when they accepted FCC funding in exchange to deploy service 
services in underserved territories. In exchange for $283.4 million annually for six years, Frontier was supposed to bring access across 28 states, including Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Washington, where rights of first refusals mean that in order to start a municipal network, one would first have to get permission from companies already serving that territory, even if they aren't in that particular neighborhood. At the time of this video, it's unclear if there'll be any penalty to the FCC, but it's going to be hard to do anything since Frontier recently declared bankruptcy and their resources are already limited. In recent presentations to investors, Frontier has emphasized that they've underinvested in fiber, with much of their fiber coming from legacy lines purchased from Verizon, and promised to invest more in fiber in the future. That being said, their bankruptcy and the massive underinvestment in infrastructure by these privileged businesses who can just buy their way into exclusivity thanks to lobbying efforts show that these companies who would do this type of activity over actually handling the responsibility they fought to get should be the last ones wielding power over communities just looking to take control of their futures. You might remember FCC Chair Ajit Pai from his takedown on last week tonight, where John Oliver made fun of his tendency to tote around an oversized rhesus mug and a feeble attempt at humor. Chances are, if you know who Ajit Pai is, you probably think he sucks. For net neutrality as well as his efforts at blocking municipal networks, he could pretty much shove his oversized rhesus mug up his ass, handle side out. Ajit Pai is a former attorney with Verizon, who in his own words is still a Verizon puppet. According to a comedy skit from FCC's annual gathering of the Federal Communications Bar Association, which had him joking about being a Manchurian candidate in a prophetic turn for his horrible sense of humor. The FCC is captured by industry, but we think it's not captured enough. So we have a plan, so we have a model. We want to brainwash and rid a Verizon puppet to install the That sounds awesome. I know, right? There's only two problems. First, this is going to take 14 years to implement. So we need to find something smart, young, ambitious, but dorky enough to throw the scent off. Whoa! In his role as the FCC chair, Pai has famously killed net neutrality, or the provision that everybody should be able to access the same internet, regardless of what your internet service provider would like you to access. Pai has inadvertently been doing his best to exemplify the economic theory of regulatory capture. The economic theory that industries end up dominating the agencies that are supposed to regulate them. In the end, they end up passing laws that are favorable to those companies at the expense of constituents they're supposed to be serving. Telecoms have spent in excess of $23 million, while the public has really shitty lobbyists. Money goes pretty far in politics, but putting your former lawyer in a position of power is some next level shit. During his tenure, Pai has worked tirelessly to promote policies favorable to big companies like Comcast or Verizon, where he'll likely return at the end of his tenure. In addition to this, he is sensitive to any reaction when people are harmed by his terrible decisions, much like Scott Pruitt referring to people calling out his numerous ethics violations as unrelenting personal attacks in his resignation letter to Donald Trump. While Ajit Pai did actually have someone get arrested for threatening to kill him around the time of the vote for net neutrality, which is obviously taking things way too far, he also definitely lumps anyone with very legitimate criticisms in that same group of extremists even though a lot of these people were making complaints that were very legitimate before this incident. If you've been to open mics, you've probably seen your fair share of bad comedy. My personal favorite was when I saw a guy bomb with every single joke, but after every single joke, he'd say, whatever, fuck you guys, that was funny, the exact same way. For a lot of these would-be comics, at some point they had the disservice of having someone tell them they were funny, which set them on a horrible trajectory of bludgeoning people with their horrible sense of humor, especially when it doesn't fit what's being addressed. Is this one of those times? Well, Ajit Pai is apparently the hellish alternative to that, as he's routinely helped to implement decisions like net neutrality, recovered for telecom misbehavior that hurts the American consumer, while rubbing their faces in it after the fact, with the worst, dated, most derivative jokes delivered in his general speaking voice that sounds like a permanent impression of Dave Chappelle as Tiger Woods during the racial draft skit. For shizzle. Following a successful killing of net neutrality, Pai tried mocking any legitimate complaints by reading mean tweets in his signature goofy manner, though some were definitely a little bit meaner than others. Ajit Pai reminds me of Pinocchio. 
Except instead of his nose growing when he lies, his head starts bubbling. Sharice, I find that really offensive. I always tell the truth. Why do you hate America? Why do I hate America? Why do I hate America? Skinny jeans, kale, the Raiders, people who say acronyms like Bay and claim to be woke. I mean, what more evidence do you need? A Pi is the Uncle Tom of the Indian people. He is an embarrassment for all non-whites. His sycophantic behavior kissing white ass is gross. As a conflicted brown man, I was on the fence, but when you put it in all caps, you persuaded me. And hashtag Ajit Pai, lose the stupid mug. And stop quoting Big Lebowski. You look like an idiot. Oh wait, you are an idiot. Never mind. That's just like your opinion, man. Imagine thinking that was the best way to follow up facilitating grifting of the public at large for your old big business buddies. During the FDR presidency, a large number of homes still found themselves without electricity. While many urban areas were wired for electricity, distance between homes made it often prohibitively expensive for private companies to provide service. As a result, many rural areas got left in the last century. In response, the Rural Electrification Administration was set up and municipalities banded together under the Electric Cooperation Corporation Act, which allowed the formation of consumer-owned electric cooperatives. This was in 1937. Four years after World War II, the number of rural electrical systems had doubled, and by 1953, over 90% of farms had electricity. To put this into perspective, San Francisco's California Electric Light Company started selling electricity to customers in 1879. Coincidentally, the average life expectancy of the average American male at that time was 58 years, which is also the difference that it took for the electrification to begin. So people in rural areas were roughly one lifetime of progress behind their urban counterparts. If it sometimes feels like when you go to certain parts of America, it feels like you're going back in time, this is nothing new. And if nothing is done, nothing is going to bridge that gap, digital or otherwise. See what it's like where things actually work, we're going to look at South Korea, where people typically pay 30 bucks a month for the fastest internet connection, which clocks in at 79 times the average American internet speed. While size can certainly account for some of this, since South Korea comes out to about 39,000 square miles, which is comparable to the state of Indiana, this doesn't really account for all the discrepancies. This comes mainly as a result of a program that combined private sector investments and government loans to roll out internet infrastructure between government entities and then national broadband access from there. Starting in the early 90s and moving forward, the government used organizations like the Korean Agency for Digital Opportunity and Promotion, or CADO, to increase internet access and supply digital literacy training, while projects like the Korean Information Infrastructure Project have worked to roll out countrywide internet access. In 1994, this focus also led to the founding of the Ministry of Information and Communications, an organization headed by leaders in the field, instead of bureaucrats or traditional political types to oversee the growth of the IT sector. This is a far cry from our situation in the US, where a Verizon lawyer heads the FCC, and testimony of Mark Zuckerberg being grilled by Congress resembles a grandson thanklessly trying to explain to a crotchety grandparent that a Wi-Fi router needs to be unplugged and plugged back in for 30 seconds. How do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. Experts in fields we typically defer to in these instances have also been remarkably bad at predicting where and when innovation will occur. Like in his hilariously titled Why Economist Predictions Are Wrong article from the June 10th, 1998 issue of Red Herring Magazine, when Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman was remarkably wrong when he stated, the growth of the internet will slow drastically. Most people have nothing to say to each other. By 2005 or so, it would become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. In South Korea, in order to support universal access, financial support was provided to entrance in the market by way of preferential tax treatment and loans. Through the process of deregulation of existing telecom entities and a re-regulation of new ones, a responsive system that supported facilitation of competition and formation of new entities like ThruNet, which combined a consortium of over 100 companies, including a power company, to roll out broadband service in 1998. Competition and what was ultimately a speed arms race facilitated by the Ministry of Information and Communications has worked to provide the Korean consumer with a number of reliable options. Whereas the American system has things like rights of first refusal to protect the investments of the first mover, South Korea has seen competition as a benefit to consumers and to their internet system as a whole. Cutting edge education has emphasized the concept of poly poly, or the concept of quick and quicker. This represents technological adaptability, 
Programs like the 10 Million People Internet Education Project, 1 Million Housewife Digital Literacy Education Project, and the PC for Everyone program work to educate and subsidize computer purchases and internet access so that cost wasn't a barrier for entry for citizens. Were we to have a similar push for Americans of all ages to demonstrate non-entertainment uses for broadband, we could improve the quality of life for citizens in ways that we don't even realize yet. Personally, for me, internet ended up influencing my life in ways that I couldn't have anticipated when I put that AOL trial disc in. I was just looking to check out the internet in a larger context outside of the classroom. Whether it was introducing me to new people in different walks of life via IGN's message boards, or finding all kinds of new music while also finding all kinds of new ways to download terrible things on my parents' computer with LimeWire, the internet took me to all kinds of places I wouldn't have ever anticipated. Even like when I found this platform and subsequently got way too into watching YouTube tutorials in my spare time and decided to use those to fix up the house I'm filming in right now. This idea of having unplanned advancements has also been Sweden's experience with municipal fiber investment. By having a passive, universal, open, dark fiber connection is more or less a pipe that is open to multiple service providers, Sweden's Stokab network has helped to provide all citizens with a baseline fiber connection and a market of service providers to deliver a low-cost service as a result of competition amongst providers. In taking this approach, Stockholm managed to ensure service while not having installation dictated by a company whose concern is only capturing the most lucrative of markets. The financial rewards haven't stopped there either, as the presence of a fiber network has allowed other enterprises like Skype to develop, with founder Nikola Zenström utilizing the network to help provide the ever-present application you've almost certainly used at some point. As a result of this market competition, rates for service are significantly low to comparative speeds in the United States. Stokab demonstrates how fiber isn't just good for internet services, but for the community as a whole, and how it should be seen as an investment instead of just another cost. Built in 1994, by 2001 Stokab had been paid off, and now it gives off $27 million a year in profits that go in financing other community needs, and it costs about a quarter to lease Stark Fiber in Stockholm as it does in New York City. In a February 2010 report for Harvard's Berkman Center, Yochai Benkler stated, In countries where an engaged regulator enforced open access obligations, competitors that entered these open access facilities provided an important catalyst for the development of robust competition, which in most cases contributed to strong broadband performance across a bunch of metrics. In other words, when the distributors cease to have gatekeeping power, they become providers of a commodity input to other businesses, similar to electrical utilities. Electrical utilities are also often the ideal means to deliver internet services as they are able to utilize the same infrastructure to run lines to customers. Chattanooga uses electricity infrastructure to provide broadband, and this model works remarkably well for them. This method is basically the same thing as when I used to work in a video store. People would rent like a ton of videos, like they'd have a cartoon, Fellini movie, and then slide a porno in. You know, like the whole idea was that like, I mean, if they had the stack, you might as well. You, you've got the stack of things, you could slide the porno in, it's just, oh, it, it was there. And so this is basically the same thing with like TV services and telemedicine, uh, working from home capabilities. And yeah, you know, there's probably going to be some porno, but you're going to get so much delivered and in such a better and more effective way. And this is the case because broadband helps deliver services. It helps to attract people to new areas. It opens up infrastructure for companies and makes medical services more effective in rural areas where it might be difficult for doctors or patients who need to travel far. By rerouting patients to specialists or pharmacists after a short video call, doctors will be able to better treat other patients so there would likely be improvements for people adjacent to telemedicine who don't even utilize it. If there are any takeaways that can be applied to Americans, so there need to be more entrance into the market and perhaps for once to receive some support before municipally owned dark fiber infrastructure. This means that there's a dedicated dark fiber connection to all homes for which ISPs can provide service, but they don't dictate your choices. In rural areas, this can be accomplished by following the models of other small municipal broadband providers, especially ones that do this upgrade in conjunction with smart grid or fully capture the potential savings that come with linking these two services. These entities, however, should use public-private partnerships when possible when people are wary about municipal ownership and bond funding when at all possible. But most importantly, they shouldn't be impeded by competitors when it comes to providing services. Education also needs to happen across the board and we need to do more to support that financially because for someone older, education and price are two major barriers for entry. If we work more to show how IT can enhance lives for those in all sectors, it will go a long way for creating a demand for fiber related services in other adjacent fields that are yet to be realized. In the US, the future isn't just in deploying fiber, but also in the potential future for the domestic manufacture of fiber equipment. Fiber is going to be crucial not just for broadband deployments, but also for the introduction of 5G. So increasing supply to meet that demand, supporting policies to do that will pay out major dividends for communities that invest in that fiber future.
After seeing COVID-19 shut down supply chains for much of the world, fiber optic cables provide an ideal market to increase production of domestic goods. If you live in states where rights of first refusal have been put in place, there's not much for you to do. Your state legislators chose telecoms and their sweet, sweet cash over you and your stupid, unlucrative problems. Barring them overturning legislation or essentially getting permission from a telecom, there's not much you can do. While not all municipal networks have been successful, there is an ever-growing body of literature on the subject that do a great job of outlining networks still in place that have succeeded, how exactly ones that have failed fell apart, and often still exist, as well as how to go about making sure that your network ends up in the former category instead of the latter. The organization Next Century Cities has a fantastic becoming broadband ready toolkit for communities that I link to in the comments. After doing some research, I think this is one of the best and most comprehensive resources for anyone looking to bring fiber to their communities. If this video is intriguing you at all, I'd recommend checking it out, but just to give you a rough idea of the process, I figured I'd go over some of the broad points to follow. Every municipality has a different community makeup and different needs as a result. The needs and desires of a community should be reflective in its leadership, and establishing an individual who can be an advocate who fully understands what is needed for the community and what should be done is crucial. With some idea of what your community needs are, it's important to do research on what usage patterns exist and how they would be impacted if costs were mitigated since usage patterns might change if people are provided a more economic option and desired service would no longer be outside of their budget. People might also be currently limiting their activity due to a poor connection. Existing supply should also be measured, which might also not be what was expected thanks to a boom in fiber laid before the dot-com bubble. By mapping out existing assets, it's possible to join the ranks of other municipalities that have found dark fiber those previously laid but underutilized. Mapping out these resources is essential for closing the digital divide and determining the best way to do it. There are numerous ways to go about delivering broadband based on how comfortable a community is with owning its own internet assets. Your overall goal should be to help people succeed while meshing with what's already in place. Part of this is helping to make the policies for the new broadband provider as non-disruptive as they can be. Mostly by putting in place did once ordinances or by having new buildings with fiber connections built in. In addition to this, it's important to bring on board people who might feel left out from this upgrade due to a lack of knowledge on the subject. One of the keys to South Korea's mainstream adoption is the emphasis on education for people who previously hadn't viewed computers as something that was for them. By educating people on how their lives can be improved, you can further reinforce the fiber demand while also improving people's quality of life. This is also how you address the dreaded question of how to pay for it. There are both public and private municipal bond structures where a local government issues revenue bonds sold by them or another entity. There's also debt financing where banks get the necessary revenue to start a network via a short-term loan. One government department can also play the role of a bank for another and loan the other entity the money necessary to start a network, or a third-party investor can come in and provide the startup capital, acting as the owner of the network until a specified date when the municipality has the option to buy that network back. Additionally, there are numerous grants from the USDA geared towards providing financial support for these projects. A good broadband community movement leader working in lockstep with the director of finances can take the desires of a community, the assets in place, and the financial support people might not realize is there to create a custom network built by and working for its own community. While some might see breaking up Comcast or other large telecoms as a loss of jobs, it's worth pointing out that by merging, T-Mobile and Sprint were able to trim their operation by 24,000 workers. This is still paltry compared to the 38,000 AT&T laid off before, and if things continue, we can expect a similar thing to happen. By blocking further consolidation and promoting smaller fiber networks, a job creation engine can be put in place. When one factors in that 80% of fiber costs are generally estimated to be in labor, it's not outlandish to suggest that if we were to perform a fiber upgrade, along with other necessary infrastructure improvements, we would see the cost of this upgrade dip even lower. If you're looking for more information on Comcast Stranglehold on the American infrastructure, I suggest Susan P. Crawford's book Captive State. If you're interested in creating your own municipal broadband network, I suggest Susan Crawford's other book, Fiber, and Matthew Howard's book Municipal Broadband, a guide to politics, policies, and success factors for cases that have worked and lessons from some that haven't. As far as online resources go, I recommend EFF's The Case for Fiber in the Home Today report and Next Century Cities Becoming Broadband Ready Kit. I've included links and in everything in the description. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see my other video on why American internet sucks, and why according to science, fiber is the best option, click here. Sound off in the comments if you work for a municipal broadband provider, or if you'd be interested in bringing one to your area. If you enjoyed this, like and subscribe so you can see my other videos as they come out.